I'm doing like twice in the morning, lunch, twice in the afternoon, maybe one late at night. And so like, no matter when somebody picks up their phone, they're gonna see me. If they're following me, they're gonna see me. If they're not following me, if they're just thumbing through reels, then hopefully I'll catch them there. That's how I'm picking up a hundred followers a day. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome back to the newest episode of the Real Estate and Show podcast. I am your host, James Chattery, financed by James on all social media platforms, here to help you with all your residential financing needs here with Kevin Iglesias, associate real estate broker. As always, it's a million dollar episode. We got the million dollar man in the building, globally known, Zero to Diamonds, very own Ricky Carruth in the building. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> what an entrance. Nice, nice. Please introduce yourself. I mean, how can I do any better than that? <laughs> <laughs> First and foremost, we want to say that we're so honored, so uh, happy to have you on our platform. We appreciate you you coming out to Long Island. And, Glad uh, to be here, man. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm out here doing an event, um, traveling, doing a bunch of events right now, and uh, kind of on tour, I guess. And um, I mean, why not, dude? Anytime I can go do a podcast like that has a nice setup with good, you know, a good show, I'm going to go do it, right? Because it's just extra content. Content is king nowadays. We were just talking about that. Like, it's a full-time job. You're shooting so much content. I do content full-time now. I mean, that's my full-time gig, like, all day, every day, filming, editing, brainstorming, you know, doing coaching calls just to create content. It's just, it's full-time. Like, literally, I'm a full-time social media. So what was the initial thought behind Zero to Diamond? Why did you do it? Um, you know, why do you spend so much time with it? Yeah, it's a good question, man. I kind of <laughs> ask myself that all the time <laughs> when I first started doing it. So <clears throat> the story is I, uh, I was asked by Remax to do a speech. I, I'd already started writing a book. So I started writing this book back in 2011. And I like, like once a year I would, I would, I would write a couple chapters in my spare time and I would throw it away and start over. And every time I started over, it got better and better. And, um, and I just, and then I put it on the shelf for like three years. And then, um, when I got to the point where I was doing a mill a year and I turned the prospecting off and I was just selling a hundred properties with a weekly email and had all this time on my hands. And I was like, I need to, <laughs> I need to finish the book because I need to share like how I did this. Cause I'm literally selling a hundred properties a year, working five to 10 hours a week on my business as a single agent with one assistant. Wow. Um, and so That's that, wild. and so I was like, I got to share this story and how this all came to be so that more people can take advantage of how simple this thing really is. So I was like, I'm going to get serious. So I started writing it again and I was like, I'm going to finish it this time, no matter how you know much I want to start over. And then I was half, I was almost done with it. And, uh, and Remax asked me to speak at, uh, at one of their events in, in Biloxi, Mississippi. And I was like, yeah. So I go do this speech and the, and I was, I was in a suit. I never wear a suit. And, uh, I was the last speaker of the day. It was a full like eight hour day. There were, you know, nine or 10 speakers. I was the last speaker. So I'm like, I'm the keynote speaker, never spoke before. This is back in 2016, had a suit on, never wear a suit, just sitting there nervous, like, um, and, uh, the whole time. And, uh, I got up and spoke and like, I was kind of sick. My voice was cracking because I was sick. And then I was nervous. It was bad in my opinion. And afterwards, like people stood in the line to like, tell me how inspirational it was. And, you know, ask me questions. And I was like, wow, people like what I have, people really need to hear. Like, that's when I realized, like people really need to hear this stuff. So I was like, okay, I'm going to finish the book. I'm going to get it published. So I did that. That was 2016, published it in 17, forgot all the stuff I wanted to put in the book. So I literally, while the editor was editing the first book, I wrote the entire second book and then traded him the edited of the first one for the unedited of the second one. Like, go edit this one now. And that's why there were two books published in 2017. So the books took off. But from there, I was like, okay, I'm going to start coaching and try to make some money on this, right? And so what happened was it morphed into from a business because, like, I see all the other coaches, you know, making all this money and stuff. It morphed into that to okay, I'm just going to do this for free. And like, 
because once I got in the game of coaching, I realized what it is. Like so many agents need help and so many agents can't afford coaching. And, th- you know, then I started putting two and two together. I was like, I could actually make a difference and reduce the failure rate in the industry. And that's why I eventually, so I was, I was charging. I tried 20 bucks a month, a thousand dollars one time, 20 by, I tried so many different like business models. I did webinars. I did this, I did everything and nothing really ever hit as far as charging goes. And I would do webinars, 300 people would sign up, a hundred would show up and like one or two would like move forward with the product. Right. And I was like, wait a minute, 300 people want some help. A hundred are serious about it because they showed up and spent time, but only one or two get to actually see what I'm doing on the back end. I was like, it just, then I was like, I'm just going to open this up to everybody and just tell anything. Cause then (laughs) I was going to events and speaking and speaking engagements and webinars and podcasts. And I was like, I was having to like hold back information that these people over here are paying for, but yet I want to tell the world, you know, how to talk to people and, how to be successful and how I've done all this stuff. But I couldn't because I felt like I would betray, was betraying these people that paid me, right? So there was a lot of factors that came to opening it up for free and eventually made that call. Uh, at the time, I had 200 paying members that I was making like 10, 20,000 a month, just residual. So I turned all that, all those payments off. I told those 200, I said, hey, everything I've been teaching you guys, I'm just going to open it up for free to the world. I had a meeting with, with the 200 and like, I thought I was going to get kind of a little backlash, at least a little bit, but I didn't at all. Every one of them. Cause I brought them so much value. You it's know? free. Yeah, well, but I mean like they were paying though. Right. Okay. This was the paying 200. Oh, and you're saying backlash from the people who were paying, who were paying gotcha, like, gotcha, Oh, you're going to, you're fixing to share everything that I've been paying for. You're fixing to share that with everybody for free now. But I didn't get that. Got right. It. I got nothing but support and love from that group. Um, it's a good group so, to have. Yeah. And so definitely. that's kind of like what, like, you know, that's kind of like how it was born and kind of why we, I took the mission statement to produce a failure rate in the real estate industry and why I've continued to, to do what I do every year. I revamp it. So it's a 60 day challenge. It's, you know, now it's a social media platform and everything else. So every year we're fixing to have an app. We've been working on that for like a year to get it launched. But every year I go in and revamp, <clears throat> revamp the entire program and just get it up to date, you know, like if there's things I want to tweak in the scripts, if there's strategies um, that I want to add, because everything's changing so fast, you know, in the world. But that's what it is, man. And, and um, I'm going to continue to always have that platform and those those programs and those courses for free, you know, open to the general public. And, you know, I've had so many agents. I have agents in that program that went from nothing to number ones in their MLS. Wow. I have tons of people that are in the top ten. I've got probably uh, for sure hundreds, maybe into the thousands of agents who have reached out and said, I was, I wouldn't be in real estate if it wasn't for zero to diamond. Like I would have quit. Um, And so we know we're reducing the failure rate because of those messages. And, um, you know, now I just want to continue to push the industry as far as I can, you know, push, continue pushing the envelope. So I don't know, man, honestly, it's, uh, um, you know, through all that, I built a huge personal brand where now I can yeah. build other businesses on top of. Who doesn't know you? And yeah. then, <laughs> like you I know, said, globally known. And then Zero to Diamond, you know, is kind of is kind of a branch of now. It, now it's more of the Ricky Caruth brand. Zero to Diamond is a branch of that, you know. And now I'm building out the rest of the branches. So uh, it's exciting to see. But yeah, I don't know, man. I'm just I'm still a roofer. You know what I mean? I'm still, <laughs> I'm still out here just laying shingles, trying to, you know, just trying to grind. To build the, the, build the, uh, the perfect house. I mean, look, it's clear that you're very passionate about this, and that's why a lot of people don't understand on your your, your stand on free uh, coaching versus paid coaching, which, of course, you had that debate on the Broke Agent Media, right, with um, uh, Byron. Yeah. And uh, what were your thoughts on that? I want to ask you, like, what were your thoughts on that debate? Oh, we're getting into it. I thought about doing, a um, like, a, uh, a uh, what do you call it, um... Uh, where I'm, where I'm watching it, you know, back and oh, like give, a reaction, yeah, video? like a reaction video. I thought about doing one like right after because, um, you know, of how that went. But uh, I, I don't know, man. I, I love, um, you know, Broke Agent Eric, you know, Dan. Um, I love those guys. Um, but 
I, I think uh, I think that like I don't I'm empathetic towards it, right? Because I think that when you're brought up a certain way, you just kind of can't help it, you know. And I, I think I think the guy that was debating me, I think he was brought up in a paid coaching type atmosphere, and he feels like that's that's it, that's the only way. Um, and so you know, he's it's you know when you. When somebody like that looks at, you know, the unknown for them, it just seems foreign and, you know, how can that be and stuff like that. So I'm empathetic towards it. Um, you know, I I would have loved to see some better points, you know, other than, you know, uh, a tweet from three years ago or, you know, whatever else he was trying to bring up. But um, I don't know. I, I think it didn't do him any justice because when you're out here, when you when, when you've got a guy who has actually – helped thousands, tens of thousands of, of agents, like, like legit, um, and really doing good work in the industry. And you're trying to tear him down. I don't think it's a good look. Um, you know, myself, but like I say, I, I accepted that because I knew exactly how it was going to play out. I thought it was funny. <laughs> I had fun. And, um, you know, it was it a good watch. It, is. it was a it was good, good watch, watch for sure. I mean, one of the the uh, the moments that I was just laughing nonstop is when the dog barked in the background, and you're oh, like, "Yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah." My dog, he just like he'll growl for no reason, <laughs> you know, and it just it, uh, it it's just irritating, you know. <laughs> No animals were harmed in the filming of that video. Just, uh, just a little FYI. Yeah. So as we're going there, question for you. We're gonna hit you with the hard hitting question that everybody wants to know. Questions. Sorry. So I'm the sure you hear this a lot, and I want to hear your take on this, and I want to hear your reaction to what you say to people when they ask you this. Right. So the question of EXP is EXP a pyramid scheme? Well, I mean, don't call me an idiot. I, the, I'm, I didn't say it. I didn't say well, it. Well, the thing is, is if, if everybody kind of pays attention and, and, um, you know, watches what I do and really follows me hard, I mean, you'll, you'll realize I don't, I'm not a recruiter, right? And I don't try to pitch EXP or try to recruit anybody, right? So, um, I have, and, you know, I've got a huge organization there, um, you know, and we provide a lot of value, but, you know, businesses that I have to go and where basically like, or let me put it like this. If I have to call someone and I'm trying to talk them into something that I'm not going to do that. Right. Right. I, I, I only want to deal with businesses that, you know, when I call and they see my number on the caller ID, they're like, oh yes. Like, you know, cause they, whatever I'm calling right. about, they're like, I need this. This is going to help me. I'm ready to roll type thing. Um, so that's why you don't see me, you know, there's a lot of guys who talk about EXP on their socials and they're doing really well. Yeah. I mean, they're doing super well. There um, are benefits clearly. Their, their, or their, their, their um, organization is growing faster than mine, but it's just not my focus. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I do, um, but it's just not my focus. But as far as pyramids go, I mean, I mean, whoever, you know, says that, I mean, it's just, it just, it's come from a place of, um, ignorance, honestly, because, you know, and, and like you, you've got the cliche, oh, well, all the brokerages are, are pyramids, you know, and everything like that. But I mean, it's like, for me, I'm like, okay, will you please explain to me what you're talking about with saying that it's a pyramid scheme or, or whatever the case may be. What it is, is that you can take and build your own brokerage using their platform and the rev share that goes back and forth is cut off the top of the top line revenue of the company um, and, and given to the agents. And it's in the form of referral fees, right? So just imagine you have you know, agents that you've built, you've, you've used this platform to build your own brokerage and EXP takes all the back end liability, payment processing, legal compliance, all that off your shoulders. You're able to expand into any market and any agents you bring in, you collect, uh, you know, two to 4% referral fee on every deal they do until they cap every year. Right. That, that's what it is. It's referral fees going back and forth. So scheme would imply it's illegal scheme would imply, 
you know, some, there's something, you know, wrong going on here, but it's literally referral fees going back and forth, um, between agents. And the cool thing is, is like in 2021, they made $300 million as a company, right? 150 million of that went back to the agents in cash. Well, you said a hundred million went back to the agents. Uh, 300 million, right? 150 million. 150 million. Because they get okay. 50 cents off the top of every dollar before they pay a single company expense. Wow. So they made 300 million. They give 150 in cash out of that year's revenue back to the agents and monthly distributions. Out of the 150 million they have left, they pay their expenses. They have 81 million profit that year, right? Wow. Now that year, Remax lost money, Open Door, Offer Pad, Zillow, Compass. Redfin, all lose money, lost tons of money, right? None of those companies give a dollar to agents. And here EXP is, they gave $150 million in cash out of that year's revenue, not reserves built up over the years, but out of that year's revenue, and then still made $81 million in the green, wow. right, in the positive. They're, it, they're so far ahead when it comes to, like, balance sheets and financials. Um, it's not even funny. It's not, there's not even a close second place. There's not even a contender when it comes to, to the company fundamentals and everything, but, but what they do for agents and that doesn't even count the equity they gave. I mean, I've been there for two years. I paid them 40,000 in fees. I have 80,000 right now in equity in the company, Double. you know, like through the stock, through through the the stock, stock share. that they give me for just selling real estate. Right. I was a three max yeah. for 10 years. I paid them a half a million. I have zero to show for that. That's just a half a million cash. I they gave them. Out. Here, I actually own part of the company. I can, you know, as the company valuation grows, my portfolio that they gave me for free grows, right? I mean, it's like, you know, it's 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 a no-brainer for me. But again, you know, that's just speaking facts. And I think people that say pyramid scheme or try to talk down on I get the, this is why I don't recruit. I get the entire ickiness of an EXP agent calling you, 15 times in a week to try to follow up with you about that was going to be my next EXP, question. Right. Yeah. The recruiting. Yeah. The recruiting. Like, yeah. I get that part. Right. Um, but there's pros and cons to every company, you know, hundred percent. Listen, dude, I I've made hundreds of thousands getting probably close to a million dollars, uh, more money than I would have if I would have stayed in my last brokerage. Yeah. So it's a financial decision. And I've also built a community, um, you know, there, you know, a thousand agents and growing, you know, we're a very close knit group, uh, you know, so there's pros and cons to everywhere. You have to kind of weigh them out and decide what's best for you. Uh, that bit back to what you're saying before too, like the recruit, I think that's where it really gets like that name because if you agree or disagree, like I feel like sometimes, cause I work with a lot of realtors, I see a lot of realtors, right? I feel like sometimes people may, you know, push more of the recruiting side than focus on doing business. Yeah. But I think that's non-unique because I think that could be in any brokerage, but I think that's where it comes from. <clears throat> but like you said, I mean, you go to Walmart, you get one bad employee. It doesn't ruin, yeah, the, it whole doesn't ruin the whole company. Hundred percent. Just to give you like a personal experience. I've had a call. I was sitting on my couch. No, I got a call from an EXP agent trying to recruit me. And I asked him, how many deals have you done? He's like, none. So what the heck are you calling me in recruiting? Go cold call, <laughs> right? Because you haven't done any deals. You should be generating income and not focusing on the recruiting side, but starting your own business and making money on that side. So, um, again, it's 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 there's pros and cons, like like Ricky said. I mean, the thing is, is that, like, um, you know, the people that are out there just focusing more on recruiting than sales, that's temporary, um, because it takes a long time and a lot of agents to build up to the point where you're making a living off of the, the other agents. That's why 75% of EXP agents never recruited one single agent. But why do they stay there? Because they love the, the culture, right? When you have a company full of agents who all own part of the company and they're not customers of the company. See, like you guys are customers of your brokerage right now. You're just paying fees in and you're their customers and your clients are your customers. But over here, it's like we're in it with the corporation. And so it creates this totally different culture. And so that's why a lot of people that don't recruit or never even make it to the levels of being able to make a living from the recruiting stay there because of the support, the culture, and, um, you know, the, the stock benefits. I mean, you get all that regardless if you recruit or not. Right. But then you always have this group coming in. And it's got actually gotten better and better, I think. 
back before I joined, um, it was really bad because they were letting it go on social media where people were literally messaging you videos and stuff left and right and just weird stuff. And like, like I knew about it two years before I came over and I didn't come over because of what we're talking about because I had that. Oh, icky, you had that yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Bad taste in your mouth. Yeah. And it, it, it took me to the point where I had to leave Remax. Like I was going to leave period to really take a step back. Plus I met Glenn like a couple weeks before I came over and um, realized like who's at the top and like what, what they're really trying, like, like these are really good people. These are really great people, you know? So it kind of helped me make a decision, but it's cleaned up a lot, but I mean, there's just, it takes so much to get to that point where you're, <laughs> yeah. so I think a lot of agents that are doing it, are just kind of dreaming and they do need to focus more on sales. And that's why with my group, we focus primarily on increasing their volume. You know, we have agents that doubled and tripled and quadrupled their volume from where they were coming over. Cause we, we, we work specifically with them on their real estate business. The recruiting is just something we don't focus on. So I just want to clear the air real quick to all the EXP agents that I work with. This was not a shot whatsoever. I love you. I said, I just want to clear the air with that. Very political. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to say You gotta be uh, political on these, these times You really right? do I just want to say EXP agents won't sell your listings you know? <laughs> Throw that out there You could get cancelled in the EXP world One of the things that came up in that debate That you that you had with Byron Which you called him uh, Bron Yeah uh, somebody said, so if Bronny. he's Bronny <laughs> <laughs> Does that make you MJ, Jordan? I don't know I didn't really think about that um, were you thinking of it in that aspect or you just like, no, not at all. Not at all. I just figured out to give him a funny name. <laughs> um, you know, I didn't really, I just, you know, um, I, I knew how he was going to come at me. I, I already knew. Um, and so, you know, yeah, I don't know. I, I think when he was born, that was probably what his mom wanted to name him. They just threw the Y in there. <laughs> Oh, oh, one thing I want to touch base on is that, um, which a lot of people don't do, you admitted that you had purchased followers. Now, what does that mean? Because there's, there's two concepts of that, right? Either you buy followers and they're bots or they're, you're paying for like advertising and people see it more and then people follow you. Uh, that's not really buying followers. When you advertise, when you boost a post and, um, and people uh, go and see your content and follow you, that's real people and stuff. That's not buying followers. Um, that's advertising. That's smart. Right. Um, what I did was contests. So like, um, I did one with, uh, Dan Brazilian or Bazarian. Uh, okay, okay, there was okay. one with him. There was one with, uh, Kevin Hart. Um, I did like two, two or three of them. Right. Where they basically say, you know, you could, it was just years ago, like where like Kevin Hart or Dan will say, Hey, um, you know, go follow, everybody on the, this, that this counts following and um, it'll be like 20 people and those 20 people paid a lot of money for these celebrities to say, Hey, go follow these people. And then they're going to, you know, and then, and then like comment under here that you did it or whatever. And then um, they would pick winners to like win a car or win an iPad or win money or whatever. And so it was like contests where celebrities would shout out and then these people would go and follow these accounts. So I did that a couple of times. It's just testing. Right. Like somebody came to me with that opportunity and was like, Kevin Hart's going to do this thing. I'm like, I, I want to see what that does. You so, know? so just to clear the air, they're real people. Yeah. They're, Wait, I would do that right now. Right. Right. Well, so, 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 so then it's not so the, well, the, the whole thing, the the whole thing, thing is, with people saying buying followers is like you're buying bots to, you know, get a higher follower, account, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And then the, yeah. the viewers or whatever they came to. But what you right. did is no brainer anybody it's pretty would do legit it. but the thing is is i would never i didn't i never did it again right so i did it, it twice got and it. i forget how much i spent like 10 like 20 30 grand but well, yeah if you got a kevin hart and yeah Dan, uh, but i don't i don't consider that like fake followers i don't, I don't consider so. either because yeah. i mean well, that was very big like oh shout out for shout out or whatever the case no kind of was but the thing is is that you have to understand who's who like who these people are so it's it's people who are like who will do anything to win an ipad so you got to think about the mentality of who, what kind of audience that really is. But what happens is on these these deals is that you get a huge bump in followers. Like I would get like a hundred thousand on one of them, um, but then like seventy five thousand of those unfollow me over the next year. You know what I mean? 
Um, so it doesn't do your account any good. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm always going to be trying to find a hack to, to get in front of more people, right. And to build my influence so that I can help more people. I'm not going to just, I'm not going to go buy bots that does nothing. Um, that's, that was, you know, to do that's just to say, Hey, I have this many people following me. Um, you know, I'm not doing it for the number of followers. I was doing it to see if I could get exposure to people that I could help. And it didn't work out because the people would follow and then unfollow, you know? So, um, so, gotcha. you know, at the end of the day, I'm glad I did it because it actually, the, the good, the cool thing that came out of it was that I connected with some of the other people that were influencers that did the same contests because they saw my name on the list of people to follow. And I saw their name. We started DMing back and forth and now we're connected and it came from that contest. So there were, there were some positives that came out of those scenarios, but it wasn't for like vanity of more followers. It was a legit uh, attempt to try to figure out if that's a legit way to grow, to build your following. But like, just for the people watching, like that's, it's not a smart move. The smartest move is what I'm doing now. If people watch my social, it's posting five to six times a day on Instagram, um, high quality content. And I'm picking up a hundred like organic real followers a day that are seeing my content organically. that are going to my profile, liking what they're seeing and following it's a hundred a day for months and months and months now. Um, that is the best way, honestly. And then at some point I'll have a video that really goes crazy and I'll pick up like 30,000 followers and you know, off of one video. Um, but that's just a matter of putting in the reps to get to the point where, cause you never know what's going to hit. Yeah, you don't. It's yeah. just the algorithm. So one thing I want to touch no, base on don't that. even. Yes, don't I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh my I have gosh. to. All right, so he's on the mortgage side, right? And I'm on the real estate side. And uh, I'll post like two or three times, maybe some days, like in one day. And he's like, oh, you're posting too much. You're posting too much. It's, it, you know, it's oversaturated, whatever the case may be. I don't say, I said that you once. You do it all the time. I said that one you time. You don't post enough. This guy posts, I know I don't post he enough. He posts like once a month. And then I'm like, bro, if you want to create once a leads week. from your social media, you have to be consistent and posting yeah. and posting. So what would you say to somebody like this guy who just doesn't listen? Now I'm just this guy. I'm not your co-host. Oh my God. What, <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, how often are you posting? I'm posting once a week, but this year I'm creating a schedule. Like I'm that's your posting. game plan? I'm going to post once no, no, a week? No. I'm doing 20. Um, my game plan for this year is 20 posts for every 30 days. Okay. So the thing is, is that, um, and you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, I'm not telling you what to do, or I'm not even going to tell you what I think works because it's working for me. It may not work for you. Um, and things may change tomorrow. So, but the thing is, is like with Instagram. Okay. If, you know, if you post at eight o'clock in the morning and that's it. Right. But you know, you've got people that are following you or even people that might've found you organically who sleep until 10. Right. Right. You miss them. Because Instagram's going to show them stuff from other people that was posted around 10. Gotcha. Okay. If you post at lunch, okay, but you have somebody that only checks it in the morning and then they have a job they can't check Instagram and they check it in the morning, you're going to miss them. They're not going to see you. They're going to see people that posted at 8. True. Right? And so when people look at their phones and check Instagram, um, you want to be there. You want to have posted very recently to when when they're gonna when they're gonna check their phones and check Instagram, and so me posting five to six times a day. You know, I'm doing like twice in the morning, lunch, twice in the afternoon, maybe one late at night, and so like no matter when somebody picks up their phone, they're gonna see me. If they're following me, they're gonna see me. If they're not following me, if they're just thumbing through reels, then hopefully I'll catch them there. That's how I'm picking up a hundred followers a day. It's because people thumbing through reels and they're seeing my stuff organically and the algorithm's gonna put the content in front of them they feel like they wanna see. So yeah. when they put my content in front of them, it's stuff that quite possibly they want to see. Then they're like, oh, who's this Ricky guy? Boom, click the profile, boom. Oh, he's verified. He he has great content. He's a real estate agent investor. I'm gonna follow this guy. He knows what he's talking about. So that's the algorithm for Instagram. You can't post enough because it's based on the, the time of when somebody's going to actually look at their phone. Um, that's Instagram. Other platforms are totally different. You know what I mean? So right well, how now, do you come up with the like question from me? This is from me. How do you come up with five or six pieces of content daily? Have you looked at my content? Yeah. 
I mean, because they're all gem. Like you come out with really good content multiple times a day. Like, what's your plan of action to get all of those? So, like, I've got so I do I do um, content where I like sit in front of the camera and behind a green screen, in front of a green screen, and and I'll film like fifteen reels in a sitting. So, like, that process is okay. Let me brainstorm for thirty minutes these fifteen ideas. Um, and then let me set up the the shot and lighting and camera and all that. Am I going to be sitting down, standing up? What am I doing? And then shoot, right? And so I'll shoot the 15 reels. I try to do that twice a week. So I try to shoot 30 a week. Gotcha, right? that's a lot. So, I, so I'll shoot 30 a week, and then I'll mix in clips of podcast. So I'll mix in clips of, of this show. Um, so I'll mix that in there. And then I'll and then I'll do uh, and then I mix in where I've got the article in the background where I'm talking about whatever the article is. Yeah, you've probably seen those. And then I've got the Twitter quotes that I'll that I'll post. Yeah, right. And so when you mix all that up, boom, you know, it's, gets pretty easy. Okay, and so I, I know sense. what times every day that I'm going to post, which is different every day, by the way, based on my profile. Like if you dig into the out the the data, it'll show you what the times are that are most opportunistic for, for posting. And then I'll map out what my week looks like and I'll stick to that for like 30 days. And then I'll reevaluate the data to see if I need to switch those times around a little bit. You know what I mean? And posting yeah. at the top of the hour is the best than posting at like, you know, 1120 or 917 or 1040 post at 10, 11, okay. 12, one, two. So I, I don't know, man, like I could talk all day about content creation and, <laughs> Like I was telling Kevin, that's what I do full time now. It's li literally filming, brainstorming, yeah, it's, it's, editing, it's full time job. So I just want to touch base really quick because there's been a debate on if you are really answering all your DMs, and I can honestly say you are. I mean, even before we set this up, we were DMing back and forth for a couple of months, you know, before this came into uh, fruition. And you, you used to send me voice memos, and obviously it's you. It's not the AI yeah. version of you. So yeah. just wanted to put that testimony out there that it, you do. Answer your, your I DM'd no. you like once two years ago, and then you just you answered, and, I, and then I DM'd you like like a week ago saying like, "Hey, I'm excited to shoot with you next week," and you answered right away too. I was like, I don't know how he does it. How do yeah. you do that? <clears throat> well, sometimes when I when you get an answer right away, it has to be because I'm in the middle of answering a bunch of DMs, and so I'm looking at my inbox, you know. So you must have messaged me right when either I was about to answer or in the middle of answering and stuff. So when I get on a roll, like I'm just on a, I'm just in the zone. <laughs> I'm just like answering DMs and stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I get like hundreds a day, and uh, if I get if I let a day or two go by, I'm really screwed. Like, it's literally going to be, like, a whole day worth of answering. But there's so much going on in there. Like, there's people, like, you know, 60 70% of it's junk, you know. Um, <laughs> Can I turn you into cartoon? <laughs> 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 Would you like a dope cartoon picture of yourself? <laughs> but, um, but, you know, not only that, but just, like, like if somebody liked my story, that shows up as a DM, right? And so like that's kind of junk, you know. Yeah, what so I mean? you just like like like, like yeah. I appreciate yeah, yeah. that and I say something, but most of it's kind of just real quick, like thanks or just heart the message or something like that. But then a good 30 percent of it is like legit, like people that need help, questions, or it's somebody that needs some kind of customer service type stuff. Like I'm like I can't log into Zero to Diamond or. Um, you know, what, you know, when, when's your, you know, what, what, what time is your event in Long Island or stuff like that, you know? Yeah. And so like right now I'm able to keep up with the DMS still. And, um, I feel such an obligation, like I feel drawn to it and it really fries my brain. Like there's days where I'm like, um, like, man, if I didn't, if I wasn't doing this, I could be doing so many other things. I could be my, using my you know, my, my energy towards much better things, but I still do it. Um, I don't know. I, I would, you know, Ryan Pineda. Yeah. yeah. I, I saw that. I saw that podcast episode. Really good. I was, episode. On a, I, was I told him I answer all my DMS and he basically laughed, laughed at me. Um, but I just got back from hit. That's where I was in Vegas. I was speaking at his event. Dude, it was amazing. A thousand people. Dude has built such a community. Shout out to Ryan. And he put a lot of that through TikTok, right? Like Instagram, the community, really. social media. Instagram, most yeah. Of them. yeah, Instagram's his biggest. Um, he did well on TikTok. I discovered him on TikTok. Yeah, I seen him on TikTok first. Um, 
but Instagram's where he's really built a really incredible community because you can really communicate with people better on Instagram, you know, as far as DMs and stuff. I have a question for you in terms of everything you just said. Where does delegation take part in your business? Like, do you delegate any of the stuff that, you know, any of the tasks that you have, or you just try to one man, like a lot of it? So my dad's handling all the day-to-day sales right now, listing appointments, showings, negotiating, all that stuff. He handles all that. We get a lead, it goes to him, he handles it, right? Then we have an assistant that handles all the admin and all the back-end, transaction coordination, MLS, setting up showings, all that stuff. Um, So that's the real estate business. So it's really kind of turnkey for me on that side. I still do the weekly email because I'm really kind of the only one that can really make them as great as I want. Like, that's my baby. I mean, that's how we get, you know, that's how our business is, you know, built. And then uh, on the social media side, I have a a company that edits my, uh, my reels, my short form content. Um, as far as YouTube goes, I kind of go back and forth. I'll let a company edit a couple and then I'll edit a bunch. So like, I'm literally like editing YouTube videos. It's nuts. But, um, delegation, where's the delegation? That's about it, bro. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, like I set up all my events, like I'm my own event manager. Um, like, uh, like if I do my own event, that's a zero to diamond, I have people in place to, um, to like help me find the venue and do all that stuff. But, um, as far as like people reaching out saying, Hey, will you speak here? They're talking to me. I'm negotiating with them. Yeah. I'm ordering the plane tickets and rental cars, um, stuff like that. So I, I don't know. That's something I need to get better at. Like, especially being around Ryan and, and his people over there, like some of those guys have 700 employees, Nine wow. businesses doing, uh, you know, 120 million a year. You know, Ryan, he's got 100 employees. You know, there's no telling how much revenue they're going to do this year. Um, and it kind of opens my mind up to, okay, I don't want 100 employees. Like, I don't want nothing to do with that. But there's, there is this, there's got to be a happy medium right. where I find people to put in place to handle certain things, especially as I start to get into other businesses and stuff, you know. Um, but hey, you know, it's all coming together. You know, I can't, yeah, I can't yeah, complain yeah, yeah. whatsoever. I'm just, I'm being patient. Honestly, it's not like I'm rushing out there to find uh, somebody to take over this, you know, right. I'm just like somebody will come along, you know, it's the same thing with the real estate investing. I've got so much, um, buying power right now. You know, um, I've got so much access to not only my own money to go put into deals, but also, um, investors money, like so much money, but, I'm just kind of chilling. I'm not like rushing out to go buy stuff. You know, maybe I should, but I'm just kind of a patient guy and I just like to grind. So I'm just kind of focusing on the day to day. I'm really trying to focus on YouTube growth right now. Like my Instagram is going great. I've, re- I've cracked that code for what I feel comfortable with. A hundred followers a day is amazing. And I feel like one day I'll hit something that like I say, takes off and get a bunch of followers in one video, but I'm really trying to focus on YouTube and making that a better experience for people that, that come watch YouTube videos. That's kind of where my focus is right at the second. Once I get that to a good place, you know, I don't quite know what I'm going to do. I'm getting into workshops where I'm doing all day workshops where I'm charging where people can come, they can work out with me. I do all day seminar basically where I teach people how to become number one in their market everything I know about social media and uh, real estate investing. So it's really, I'm really excited. I'm doing the first one in Orlando next week and then in my hometown, February 10th. And then I'm putting together one in Chicago in March. But, um, but that's something I'm focused on to see if I can turn that into a real business. Another thing I want to get into that I am getting into and moving forward with is creating a, a, a program that teaches people exactly my process of creating content you know, the whole nine yards of everything I do, um, from top to bottom. And, um, and then, and then creating a program out of that to teach people exactly what my process is, but then also on the back end having a, basically a media company that, that edits their videos and different things like that. And also create a a community out of that. Uh, There's something there. I haven't quite figured out the details, but there's a business there that I can create that will do very well if I put it together. Right. So, it's kind of some things I'm focusing on, but my biggest focus right now on top of all that business wise is buying a hundred million dollars worth of multifamily this year in the mm-hmm. Southeast. Um, but I've looked at 50 deals or so in the last six weeks 
And like, there's a big shift coming, dude, in multifamily. Um, the, you know, a couple months ago, um, interest rates on the average commercial loan exceeded cap rates for the first time since 2008. Rents are through the roof. Um, you know, they're not going to continue to do, to go up like they have been. There's, there's a reckoning that is, that is, is just beginning on multifamily. We're going to see prices come down on these buildings. There's no doubt. On commercial? Um, on, on multifamily apartment complexes. Maybe commercial as well. I haven't really studied commercial, like strip centers. and. So you're saying like two to four unit, like that's like. No, I'm saying like 100, 200, 300 unit. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, gotcha. like big multifamily buildings. Um, prices are going to come down. There's no doubt about it that they will be coming down. So like I'm sitting here with all this power ready to roll. I'm looking at deals like, okay, let's buy something, but nothing makes sense. The numbers don't make sense. And if an investor yeah. is going to risk their money on an apartment complex, they're going to, they want to return, right? It, they can go make zero risk and buy a CD or a bond and make two, three, four, five percent 5% for, with no risk at all. Yeah. Why would they go, you know, get into a partner complex deal, you know, for the same or even lower in a lot of cases, um, you know, with a lot of risk on the back end, you know, there's a yeah. lot of risk right now with multifamily. So I'm excited to, to become more educated in that sector because I'm going to absolutely crush it. So that leads off. Do you think the market is going to crash? That's the million dollar question that everybody keeps saying. I mean, you see a lot of influencers no. saying it. Mm -hmm. uh, so many people are saying the market is going to crash. Well, I mean, and like I'll make videos and I'll say, you know, we're about to go on another surge or, the market's just fine or whatever. And like, you know, there's the keyboard warriors will come out and say, Oh, well, it's going to crash and burn. Like, what are you talking about? Oh, that's real optimistic uh, in the time like this and stuff like that. And they never provide any data. So like in my videos, I literally screen share the data, you know, and I, I show people exactly, you know, where it is. I'm not, and I'm not saying, Okay, this is what's going to happen. I do say that this is what I think is going to happen. But like in real estate, what you do is, is like the surface level of your success is not predicated. It's only predicated on you because the market has nothing to do with you surface level success, average success, right. because closings will happen every day, no matter what. But if you want to become number one in your market, it, you want to go deeper than the, the surface level. And that's where, okay, once you've conquered the space where you know the market can't take you down no matter what. When you've conquered that and you have your business in place and you're solidified and everything's solid, well, to reach the upper echelon now at that point is to say, okay, I've figured this part out where I'm good no matter what. Now, how do I become number one? Well, at that then to go deeper is to try to figure out, okay, what's the most certain outcome of the market right now? What's the most certain thing that's going to happen over the next six to eight months? Let me build a game plan around what, what I think is the most certain is going to happen in the market. And if that doesn't happen, I still win because I win no matter what. But if I can, if I can make a bet, a big bet on something that, that's most certainly going to happen based on data and you win that bet, then that's what could actually push your business to those really upper, upper levels. So in the beginning, it's like you don't have to worry about what the market's doing. You just got to get your business right. But then to reach those upper upper levels, you have to pay attention to the market and then try to put two and two together. Okay, this is what might happen. This is literally how I became number one in my market. I could tell you this story if you guys want. But right now, uh, what we feel certain is going to happen, okay? So if you look at inventory from 2014 to today, Right. It goes like this. Right. It, it shoots up to the moon every year. Right. Literally straight line up and then straight down every year, up, down, up, down every single year. Even in 2021, when we had the boom and everything, if you look at inventory, it went up. Nobody's talking about that. That inventory went up that year. Right. Nobody's talking about it. It went up and then it shot down just like it always does. And then it came back up this year like it always does, and now it's trending down. And that downtrend normally, you can look at this, you can look at Redfin data, you can look at any any place that has data, you can look at this and it's the same thing, da 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 Well, normally that downtrend of inventory leads all the way into February. 
where it kind of starts to bottom out, you know, and then it starts kind of coming back up. So right now we've got around, let's just say half of the listings out there that we had pre-pandemic. Half, right? And we were already low. In yeah. Pre-pandemic, we're already low. And now we're like half. And now it's fixing to go down. It's as we speak, is going down now, right? And so now, now it's coming down. Inflation is coming down. Right? Yeah. It's been coming down since June, right? Slowly. Um, not a there's not a guru on earth that says inflation isn't going to come down this year, right? Thirty year fix are directly tied to inflation and the ten year treasury, not yeah. not the Fed rate. So so if inventory is coming, if, if if inflation is coming down, right? Rates have to come down too. And rates are. Rates have already come down. They're like yeah. six. I don't know what they are today, but it was 6.09. I can say this because this is not towards a specific person. I quoted somebody a rate yesterday at 4.625 on a 15-year loan. Yeah, 15 years are cheaper. Like the 30-year fix was like 6.09, um, you know, yeah, the day before yesterday or whatever when I looked. Even like, even a 30-year, I put the, the same client with 30-year yeah. was like 4.99. Like we're it's, back in it, the fours. It's coming down. Yeah. Okay. And so as as the 30 year fix and as the interest rates for mortgages come down with inflation, inventory is also coming down at the yeah. same time. All right. And so what happens is is as the interest rates hit that level where the buyers are more comfortable with buying, they're all going to come out at once, right? But guess what? They're going to be fighting over the same house again. Yeah. Right? For me, it's like I can look at the trends and I can look at you know, what's happening in the market, it's real easy to see what's going to happen. Um, or, or it's real easy to see what we feel like is the most certain, right? There's a good chance that this is going to happen. Now, over the past week, I've gotten so many messages and comments from agents all over the country that says multiple offers, more than asking price, you know, people lined up all around the street to get into an open house, 70 showings on my listing day one, uh, I'm talking about all over the country, so many agents in the within the past week, right? It's already beginning. Redfin came out and said um, 50% more. They And then I, I actually Googled it to see if people were actually Googling. I Googled to see if people are Googling houses for sale. 50% more people are, ser- are searching on or go- Googling houses for sale than were back in November, which was the low. Yeah. Right? So you have this uptick of people who are searching online right now, which is going to translate into physical showings, which will translate into mortgage applications, yeah. which will translate into pending deals. We're seeing an, we'll see an increase there later. This is going to take months to play out, right? Because I did a video and I'm like, we're, this is the beginning of the surge. And I'm like, 50% more people are looking online for houses. And, and some guy was like, well, why is uh, mortgage uh, applications at a 15 year low? I'm like, bro, let's watch the video. <laughs> I said that this is going to happen in stages. This is stage one. Then they're going to look. Then they're going to put applications in. Then they're going to have, you're see pending deals. It's going to take months to play out. But I think, like I said, when I started the podcast, I think this is going to be an above average year. I don't, I, honestly, I, I'm with you. And hopefully it's a the good for, year for everyone The formation of families, you know, because the birth rate's back in the 80s. And how many people are turning 33 this year and next year and the year after is ungodful amount. And the formations of families, these aren't people that want houses. These are people that need yeah. houses. This is true demand, okay? The, the the formations of families in the U.S. is is reaching an all-time high level. And it has to do with when they were born, right? Back in the 80s. And this is now they're 33. And we're going to see true demand, not people that want to upgrade because, you know, they want a nicer house that need houses and builders, builders aren't building. They're down like 30, 40%. So now new construction is taking a hit. And so my question to the bears is, okay, right. So let's talk about worst case scenario. Okay. Where's the bears at? Okay. What, what, you know, give me some, give me some data. Give me some facts. How is this going to crash? What's going to happen? All right. Oh, well, Traditional sellers aren't really going to sell. They're sitting on, you know, 65% of mortgages in, in the U.S. are under 4%, 24 below 3%. Those people aren't really, the, the, they will sell, but they're going to have to really see the house they really love to upgrade to. Yeah. It's going to take something really special to get them to sell. Most of them are just going to ride that 3 or 4% out, right? Right. You're not going to see an influx of, of inventory from traditional sellers. We're, we're not going to see builders ramp up 
quickly. They'll they'll get back to where they're. But they were behind before they even started to ramp down. They yeah. couldn't even keep up. You know when they were when they were rolling. <laughs> Weren't enough you houses know, on the market. Like, they couldn't get their hands saying. on enough they, houses. They, yeah. they, they had, like, a waiting list of people that wanted yeah. houses. So they can't even keep up when they're going 100%. I mean, they're down 30%, 40%. So it's not going to come from traditional. It's not going to come from builders. Okay. Well, we're going to see this massive wave of foreclosures um, with all the layoffs and everything. Well, 58% Americans, on average, have 58% equity in their homes. 58%. Equity. It's because prices went way up, right? But the thing is, is prices are going to have to go way down to get to the point where they would have to sell it just to break even, right. much less at a loss. And you, you have to you have you you have to owe more than the house is worth to in order to get into a short sell situation, right? We're not going to see that. Yeah. Prices would have to go down fifty if we already right now have have agents around the country that are talking about multiple offers and all these showings on listings and stuff like that. True. Prices are lower than what they were. You know, it's not like we're getting 50, hundred thousand more than we, you know, like we did, you know, two years ago, but um, it's like, where's the inventory going to come from? Right. Um, on top of the fact that even if there was this, like, cause if people got in trouble with their house, they could just sell it and, and take the equity. They don't, I mean, you know, if you have, if you have 30% equity in your house and you're in trouble, let me just sell it and, you know, make Cash 50 out. grand yeah. right now, right? So that's one reason. Another reason is, on top of everything else, the elephant in the room is the government, you know, and, and also the regulation on loans, how well they've regulated loans this yeah. time around and how safe of a bet that it's been. Um, but between the banks and the government, they're not going to get into that situation like they did again in 2008. It's just not going to happen. So la last question. Um, drop. We're seeing so many. Yeah, that was that was amazing. We're seeing so many institutions, big institutions, purchasing purchasing uh, single family homes. Do you think there's going to come to a point where single family homes are going to become so non affordable that if you're not buying a house a year or two years from now, that it's, you're basically going to miss the wave because everything is going to continue to be either purchased and rented, and there's going to be more uh, rental properties out there because we see it with all these firms. They're they're buying a lot of property, spending a billion dollars on. Uh, on real estate, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Billions. I think that um, I think there'll always be a market for people that want to own a house and have home ownership, and so I think builders will. Uh, I think there'll always be builders that will sell direct to consumer, um, just because that's a market. When these big institutions come in and buy these properties, they're going to expect the discount. They're going to want to buy in bulk, and you know they're going to want to buy, you know. Um, at these big discounts and, you know, the, there's always, I think they'll all, you know, and when you sell to individuals, you're going to get more for the houses. Right. And so I, I think that there's always going to be the market for people that want to own their home. And I think there's always going to be builders who want to do it the traditional way and just build individual houses for homeowners to maximize what their profits are on the back end. Um, you know, so, and I think that, uh, the big institutions that are buying all these rental properties, like you think about where it could be in 10, 20 years, right? How much property they could accumulate by then. Um, we'll see where it goes because like right now, you know, it's kind of a crunch, you know what I mean? And so if the, if these companies go out and kind of over, exert right or over leverage in in in, a, in, a, in certain situations they could kind of be in trouble right so if they like example if they put all their eggs in a single family home basket and then something happens in that sector they could they could put themselves at a in, a in a bad position right and so i don't think these companies are going to go out and put all their eggs in in this basket i think it's going to be just a way to diversify their portfolio i don't think their goal is to go out and make us you know the us a rental country where there's only rental houses and nobody can own anything uh, i do think prices are going to be higher you know in five years on houses i think they're going to be higher in 10 years i also think wages are going to be higher i think people will be making more money um so i think it's all relative when it comes to that but uh but it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. I think the amount of institutionally owned houses right now is such a small, 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 small percentage of the total houses in the US that it's not even a factor right the second 
could have become a factor at some point. Sure. I just, I don't think it's anything to worry about. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it's, it's like chat GPT, right? People are worried about it taking jobs. Yeah. AI, okay? yep. Right. But the thing is, is when, you know, like how many people do you know that are a farmer? Not, not but back me. in the day, yeah, every single person did something to do with being a farmer. They were yeah. they worked on a farm in some form or fashion. But those jobs were all taken by robots, right? They're all they're all gone by robots. But yet our population has grown. You know, we're at three hundred and thirty million people, but yet everybody has a job that wants one. Not everybody wants one. No. But but everybody that has a job wants one. There were more jobs created. Like there were there were different jobs that were that were you know, invented along the way. And so I think the same thing here, like, um, you know, like it may take someone's job, but there's going to be new jobs that are invented. And, you know, there's always going to be an opportunity for somebody to work, you know, to have a job, you know? So, um, like, you know, I think jet chat GPT could probably do that right now. You know, everything that's happening in here, you know, is, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, you might um, be replaced by AI. Is basically what he's saying. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but Ryan is Ryan. We love Ryan. But somebody's gonna have to set it all. Like, you know. Um, but it, it's it's you know it's all it's all relative. I believe right as as the um, human race human human race advances. We're going to see advancements in different job opportunities pop up. And I don't, I think people need to be flexible with, you know, what they do. That's why I love what I do. You know, I'm a, I'm a communicator. Yeah. You know, I love, um, you know, I can go out and basically be a salesperson for anything. Now they say chat, chat GPT can go out and replace salespeople now. Like they can actually have the conversations and, and stuff like that. You ain't out selling me though. So it's going to be real interesting to kind of see, you know, how the how that advances, you know, over time. Yeah. Um, but there's always going to be I know that there's always going to be an opportunity for what I do in the world. And I'm going to always be looking for the opportunities. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this as we were just speaking that the field that we're in. Do you think that there are parts of our industry that could be automated or be, you know, taken away? No, because. Everything that you say wasn't said yet. And so AI basically takes, um, you know, it, it like has all the research from the past. Yeah. Right. And then it computes, you know, what it thinks you might do or say, but it's not you. It's, it's, yeah. it's guessing at what you might do or say, but there's only one you, you know what I mean? So no, I think that, uh, I think like, you mean like podcasting? No, no, no. Just like real estate wise, like real estate wise, real estate no. agents, mortgage lenders, attorneys, title, anything like that. No, I don't think so. I think what will happen is, is it'll make your life easier, just like Zillow made our life easier. Right. So I used to have to go out and actually look up properties for people. Oh, you want a house, 400,000 in this neighborhood and blah, blah, blah. OK. Uh, you know, and I would actually have to go search the criteria, look through the houses pick out the five best ones, email them to them, see what they thought. They send me back. I like these three. Let's go look at them. Uh, that was a lot of time spent. Now with Zillow, people look on there and they're just like, they just call me and they say, hey, I want to look at three, these three houses. It cut out all that time. So it made yeah. my life 10 times easier and I'm able to sell more property because I can spend that time I used to spend looking up properties on trying to reach out to more people. And seeing what I can do to help them, so I can multiply my business. Zillow made a situation where I can now multiply my business and scale my business much better. Same thing with this. I believe AI is just going to make your life easier to be able to do your job a lot easier, um, to where you're, you'll be able to actually produce more. And that's right. what's going to be interesting. Um, yeah, it's it's mind blowing what AI is doing now. You know. Yeah. But. I just want to say we're completely uh, ecstatic having you here. Having was this you all the platform. questions? I thought there were going to no, be No, I still have. Questions. I still have one. Okay, okay, okay. One Last more heavy. One, I was one like, more question. I was like, where's it? <laughs> <laughs> and you guys were prepping me up. Well, for just it. to <laughs> make it clear, people thought you bought fake followers, but okay. we cleared the air. You did not buy any fake followers. You didn't give your Instagram account the Liver King supplements. You know the steroids that everybody <laughs> thought uh, thought that you did. So just to clear that up. 
because uh, people were were asking. People us about think that. I'm on steroids. <laughs> oh, one question I actually got. I'll literally show you if you don't believe me. Was how much do you bench press? Oh, I haven't maxed out in a while, but I would say probably three. Jeez. Three plus. Damn, that's crazy. I could do yeah, that. I did two twenty five like twelve times the other day. So, but I I'm scared to put a lot of weight on there. Like I two twenty five for twelve reps. Yeah. It's like football player numbers. I, I, well, I used to be a linebacker. Oh yeah, true, yeah. true, true. But that I, makes sense I, uh, I'm scared to max out because I don't want to hurt anything. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's I worked crazy. out this morning in the little bitty gym at the Allegro. Well, another question I had for you was, what are the three things that agents should be doing right now, like newer agents? Give me three things that they should implement into their business today. Well, I mean, <clears throat> most important three they things. Have to, they, agents need to get the basics down first, right? As far as the like that the market doesn't matter. Like you got to wrap your head around this stuff first. Mm-hmm. You know that the market doesn't matter, right? You got to get that out of your head. Um, you know, you got you got to understand how hard this is going to be. No matter, like a lot of agents get in and they they they're like, oh, I, I know how hard it's going to be. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you think you do. It's that times twenty. And that's why you see a lot of agents quit because they get in and they they either don't know, even think it's going to be hard, or they, they know, but they have this expectation of how hard, and then it's 20 times harder. So, and then they start getting like, man, this is I, this is a lot tough, and then they quit. So, like, you got to wrap your head around the basics, man. And then, and, then the, and then the biggest one is that when you talk to a prospect, you should not care if they buy or sell or not. Right. When you're when you come in contact with a with a prospect, a lead, if you're cold calling, if you're um, if it's, you know, a Zillow lead, a Facebook, a anybody referral, open house, whatever you should. Your expectations should be zero, um, you know, and the more time I've wasted on people, the more money I've made. I never got a buyer agency agreement signed. I've never got anybody pre-approved before we go look at houses. I've, none of that stuff because I don't really care about all that stuff. I'm just trying to get to know you. You want to go like, you're my buddy now, right? You're my, you're, you're the prospect and we're talking and now you're, you're my, my buddy too. And now you're my buddy. And so you want to go look at houses, buddy? Let's go look at houses. Like I'm Let's not trying it. to like figure out if you can actually buy or what the deal is. Cause I don't really care about that. But when you get on the inside of how, what people are thinking about their situation, if you can get inside their cranium of exactly what it is, like if you can get to know them, connect with them, give them that great first impression, warm and fuzzy, and then from a place of genuine curiosity, um, find out what it is they're trying to do and why, then it's over at that point. Then everything just falls into place. You know, whether they want to buy now or five years from now or whatever, it's done deal, right? And when you and you, when you connect with people, like that, it turns into 10 to 20 deals over the life of your career because they repeat business, referrals, referrals of referrals. Um, and then when you when you look at it like that, the referrals of the referrals of the referrals and the repeat business of all those people, it's like in the beginning of your career, like those very beginning relationships in the first year are really worth 100 deals per relationship, right? Or definitely have the potential to be like 100 deals to you over the next 20 years through that one relationship, And you got agents quitting eight months in. They have a database of 200 by then. And I'm like, dude, that's you you have your entire career, right? Like that could literally be your entire career. And you're giving up. You got in this business to do it for 30 years. You're giving up after eight months because it's a little hard. What are you going to do? Go work 40 hours a week on somebody else's business? I'm like, no, like work this business like it's somebody else's business. If that's what you need to tell yourself, you know what I mean? But um, you got to understand all that first, man. Like I can tell you the ABCs of how to succeed in real estate. It's super simple. But if you don't understand all the stuff I just told you, then it's going to be hard for you to go out there and really execute. And go right right over it. Yeah. Right. So for the ABCs, it's real simple. Call people all morning, do social media and all your marketing all afternoon, and do a weekly email on the same day of the week forever. You're done. It's really, really, and I don't care where you get your leads from. I don't care who you're calling, where you get your leads from. I don't care about that because people think I'm this cold caller guy. I'm pushing cold calling and everything. I'm not. I'm, I'm pushing how to talk to people once you get the lead. I don't care where you get the lead from. I just want to know that you're getting enough leads to accomplish your goal, that you know exactly how to talk to them, that the that the objectives are in place, right, for that long-term relationship. Because when you do, when you operate like that, you're getting your short-term business and your long-term business, 
right? Because if, if you connect with them and you're building a relationship and they want to do something now, you're going to do the deal. Yeah. Right. And then if they don't, they want to do a deal later, you do the deal later. So it That's comes true. down to that point. Once you get all that put together and you have your mechanism of the weekly email to stay in touch with everybody forever, now you can just scale to the moon. It's just at that point, once you get all that, it's just about how many people you talk to in your market. So then it comes down to efficiency of who we're talking to. I just want to talk to property owners that own the exact property I want to sell. Why would I waste my time doing anything else? You know what I mean? And when you build your communication skill up to the level where you can literally talk to anyone and make them feel great and special and all that stuff, then it doesn't matter if you're cold calling or warm calling or lukewarm calling or, you know, wah. Just go, (laughs) right? Just go talk to people. Yeah. Right? And so then it doesn't matter, right? Now it's not even cold calls. Yeah. So I don't know, man. Like, I, I love the cold calling. I just love it. You know what I mean? Like calling someone, getting to know them, seeing how they're doing a day. I don't know. I just, people are like, oh, I don't like getting cold called myself. So I don't want to cold call others. And, um, you know, I'd rather pay $1,000 for a Zillow lead. Any lead gen activity you do is literally just data collecting. Yeah. Right. And so like if you do Zillow, you're just getting their data so you can talk to them. If you do open houses, you're just collecting data at the door so you can then talk to them, call them and talk to them later. If you do Instagram ads, you're just collecting data. If you do, if you do YouTube, you're hoping they click a link and put their information in. So you have their data. So you then call them. It all comes back to the same thing, just data collection and then actually talking to people. That's how real estate works. That's the process. It's just a matter of how you collect the data. So if I, have a, if I have a system where I can pick up the exact people I want to talk to for a penny a piece and I got their data for one penny and it's the exact person I want to talk to, not a random person, I don't know what else is better. You know what I mean? That's just me. Again, I'm not the god of this. I'm just a guy that used to roof houses that you know, ended up selling 100 properties a year for a while and now I'm building other businesses. Well. Mike a John. lot of gems dropped today. <laughs> well, again, it, w- it was an honor. I mean, uh, you gave us so much knowledge. That was it? That was the hard question? No, no, no. That was just a question. Okay. <laughs> so, as you can see, there is no hard question for uh That Ricky. was all the questions? <laughs> yeah. I mean, w- oh, okay. we just we just put it, like, in a way that was... Uh, User not friendly. So, yeah. We're not, we're not trying to attack you or anything. No, no, no. I, I, get, I get that. I just... You guys are really hyping up that I was really going to get hit with something today. No, that's it. He's All not right. worried about nothing. Basically. Unless, I mean, Kevin, unless you have anything else. Would you have that debate again with uh, with uh, Byron? I don't know. I mean, it's kind of like, it'd be kind of like watching, you know, uh, we'll see, what was a boring fight. I mean, it was, it's, it's kind of like, really like watching like... Uh, Dustin Poirier fight McGregor again. You know, who wants to see that? You know what I mean? Nobody really, I don't think anybody wants to see that again. You know what I mean? What what I have a debate with um, somebody that's more legit um, and that could actually, you know, um, not like come at me crazy legit, but like have a a real conversation around it and be open-minded and um, do it and do it for the sake of helping agents as opposed to just trying to attack somebody then yeah absolutely all day long so like a tom ferry debate i don't know tom um but yeah um you know absolutely free free uh coaching versus paid coaching yeah yeah i mean i would be open to to it um you know like i say um you know i now i used to talk smack about paid coaches, you know, I used to do content around paid coaches and stuff like that, but I haven't done that in a long time. Um, and the reason was, is because I realized people that talk smack are talking smack about people that are way ahead of them in life. And I was like, wait a minute, you know, like I'm not really, this isn't really me as far as, um, chasing people or talking smack about somebody because yeah, you don't talk smack about people that are below you or behind you in life, right? People only talk smack about people that they're, that that's ahead, people that are in places that they wish they were, right? And Tom has a really big brand. Um, you know, how he got it is unique, you know? And um, I find it fascinating, honestly. But, but yeah, um, you know, listen, like, just like when I walked in here, and you guys said, oh, got some tough questions. Like, I was like, okay, whatever. 
Like, and like I took the, <laughs> listen, I, I took the Byron thing knowing exactly what it was going to be that I was going to get attacked. Um, you look very unfazed in the video, by the way. I, I knew exactly. What were you drinking? Coffee? Soda? Probably water Energy or drink? something. I think I was drinking. <laughs> no, I think I was drinking a liquid death. Oh, uh, okay. Water. Okay. But um, I quit drinking and smoking uh, back in 2014. Um, I haven't drank a sip. I drank for 20 years. I was really wild. Um, you know, you guys, you guys wouldn't have wanted to see me back then because I was, you know, I was out there. I mean, you benched three, 300 plus. I don't know if I'd want to mess with you either. <laughs> I was, so. uh, I was, uh, I just like to have fun, you know? So, um, you know, those are some wild days I'll, I would never take back, but yeah, I mean, to answer your question, bro, um, I knew what I was walking into there and, you know, I took it with the heartbeat, a, a funny story. And he brought it up in the beginning. I wasn't even going to bring it up. He was like, you know, he wanted to get it out there before I said something, which I never was going to say something. He was like, you know, because he backed out on me twice on that thing. You know, he on asked the debate. Me, yeah, he asked yeah. me to do. He I, asked me to do it twice, and twice, he backed okay, out and he twice. Backed out. And then the third time, I was like, "I'm not. You already backed out twice. I'm. I don't have time to schedule and put something in place for you not to show up a third time. You know, but whatever." Yeah, I saw that um, opening statement. It was very, I wasn't uh, even going to bring it up. He was trying. Eminem, uh, Eminem, you he know, was ish. trying to do. Uh, he was trying to um, throw, throw a block. Dis- throw a disclosure out there or whatever. That was something that wasn't even relevant. I was there, honestly, to try to get in front of more agents to really showcase who I was. I knew that that would get me a little more exposure to a different audience and um, let people know that I, I'm actually here to care about people, I'm not a fraud type deal. You know what I mean? I think they were trying to make me out to be a fraud, or at least he was. Like, Eric and Dan are great. I mean, they're awesome. Shout out to them. Yeah. I mean, um, but whatever. Do we have your permission to label this video is P- EXP a pyramid scheme? The only no, that's th- a no. All right, we can. <laughs> 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 Why would you even ask that? I don't know. I think they'll get a lot of clicks. <laughs> the thing about it is, is that I'm just I'm not an EXP recruiter. You know? I think it's because of the fact that like there, I think on Long Island, like there's just a lot of people who, I think over the pandemic more, but now they kind of fizzled out. You know, but like over the pandemic, it was like a big thing. So it's like, it kind of does like, you know, trying to recruit, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like it was kind of like a really big thing to the point where like people were saying like, oh, like, oh, I know I'm about to get recruited or, oh, they like have a countdown. It's like, oh, within five seconds, I know they're going to try to recruit me and stuff. But I work with a lot of agents from EXP who do not care about that. Like they don't even touch that side of it. They just like it for the company. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was saying. Yeah. Um. But for me, like, I'm trying to build massive businesses, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, like, it's just not, like, a big focus for me. I hear you. You know? I mean, like I said, I do it. I have a big group, and, you know, we get together twice a week. Um, you know, we – it's great, and we, we help we help a lot of agents there. I use it as a, just an extra platform to help agents where I can actually work more closely – so I work one-on-one with all of them and this and that. But um, it's just like I see bigger things, right? I see mortgage. I see syndication deals. Um, I see this workshop thing being something, right, that could really help people. I see this media company thing that I want to do. I see that it has potential to be a big company. I mean, I just see bigger things. Well, well is there anything you want to leave our audience on? Um, you know, obviously – he answers every DM. Ask many questions that you want. Make sure to follow him if you Nothing don't already. Makes him uncomfortable. He's very transparent. <laughs> <laughs> he wants the hard, tough questions. So <laughs> I'm sorry we couldn't give you harder questions. I'm sorry. I don't yeah, have anything what? to hide. It's a thing, right? right when I walk course. into this, there's no skeletons in my closet that I'm worried about somebody trying to drag out, right? And if there if there is something, you know, like the the contest thing to get followers. I'm more like I did on like I didn't I didn't know he was going to go there uh, in that debate because Byron brought this up, too, you know, and yeah. I was immediately like, yeah, this is what I did. This is how I do it. I mean, he was like, oh, he was so surprised if you saw his face that um, I, he was like, oh, I appreciate you being honest with that. Like it threw him off so much that I, I didn't say I didn't never buy followers. You know, that's what he was, <laughs> that's what he was expecting. <laughs> 
That's what he was expecting, but he didn't get that, right? You're never going to get that from me. You're going to get real. Yeah. Every single time. And that that's that's like like I'm too real. That's why my following's not as big as it could be. But then again, that's why the my following is as big as it is. Right. Yeah. Right. If I was if I was out there telling people what they want to hear, right? Like go build your business on YouTube, right? Like some of these guys, then maybe I have a bigger audience because I'm playing into the trigger word of what people want to hear, but I don't tell people what they want to hear. That's the thing. I'm like, you got to call people like get the leads on YouTube, but then you got to call them. Now, how are we going to talk to them? What's the objectives? How are you going to play this out? What's the long term and short term game plan for these leads? Um, I'm just too real. So I'm going to tell people exactly what it is. That way I can sleep at night. Makes sense. I mean, like I said, there's nothing that throws you off whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Just anybody, all our future guests, we always ask them, hey, is there anything you don't want to discuss? And you were like, nope. You were just like, ask me whatever you want. <laughs> because because I want, because like the things that people are curious about, I want to be out. Right. You know, I, yeah. I want like if somebody has questions and that's why I was waiting on something I've never heard before. When you guys were talking about that earlier, I was thinking, I was, I was like, oh, great. Maybe it's a question I haven't been thrown. You know, the EXP one I've been thrown, the follower thing I've been thrown. Like, maybe it, maybe it's something new you guys can dig out of me, you know, to share with people. But I feel defeated. <laughs> I feel like we didn't do our job. We should have done something like no, that. No, no, no. <laughs> no, you guys did great. No, I mean, you just you just being in the room with us here and getting the cosign, you know, it, it means a lot to us. Because believe it or not, there's always going to be people, be people who tell you, hey, don't do this. It's a waste of time. We got that feedback when we put that idea out there, like, hey, this is what we're going to do. And they're like, why? Why are you going to have other guests and you're going to be paying for them and whatever the case may be? Because this is not cheap. As you know, producing content isn't a cheap thing to do. People are asking why you're going to have me on? No, 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 no not you. Just in general. The general. idea of our podcast. Like when we first started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like I said before in the, the beginning. Those people don't get it at all. No. Like this is a world of content, right? This is what's going to make people know who you are and get to know you, you know, and your personality and everything. You know, have you guys ever heard of this company EXP? I'd love to tell you guys about it one day. <laughs> oh, it's been, it took you long enough. <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Anything else you want to leave us off with, uh, Ricky? I'm good. I'm good, guys. I appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, have some fun with you guys today. And we'll do it again soon. We got a lot of content uh, out of this episode. We're definitely excited to, to c- cut it up. Hey, thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope it brought you tons of value. Let me know what you think in the comments. and I'm going to put the next video right here for you so you don't have to go anywhere. You can just click this video to keep that Ricky train rolling. Hey, we'll see you guys on this next video, and I'll talk to you soon.